So some typical structures, system responsibilities. I've listed out the ones for the Artemis Keepsack Kit, but the point is you want to adhere to general mass constraints set out by the form factor. So for us, it's the 1U form factor and the launch provider. And this happens during the design process. So you all should be intimately familiar with these requirements already. Um, for your mission, you may have to add a specific subsystem requirement depending on your mission. If you say have a deployable or um, if your payload had to be viewing some certain face relative to another component, those are good requirements to put in here. So the already existing requirements are that the CubeSat kit has to remain within this 1U cube form, sorry, form factor. Um, there are some requirements such as protruding corners per the NASA CLSI, CSLI requirements. Um, there is some clearance height. The four edges of the CubeSat kit have to adhere to some hardness rating. The critical load that this overall structure has to withstand has to be 1200 newtons specified by the CSLI requirements, and it has to be in this direction. There's a maximum mass for the CubeSat kit to not exceed 1.33 kilograms. And then this is an interesting one. Um, the center of gravity or the mass distribution within the spacecraft has to be within two centimeters of its geometric center. So that's something that you'll also have to figure out in your CAD when you update your CAD, so computer aided design, make sure that the payload when it's placed in there doesn't skew the center of gravity further than two centimeters away from the geometric center, which is gonna be at the five centimeter, five centimeter and 5.675 centimeter location. The structures system also has to satisfy all strength and stiffness requirements of the spacecraft and launch vehicle. And this is done during the design and integration phase. So you want to design a primary structure such that when a critical load is identified and applied to that primary structure, you have a factor of safety greater than two. Um, here is the Artemis CubeSat kit. And here's the resulting analysis with the ultimate factor of safety being 4.98. Factor of safety is a metric for structural integrity or um, your confidence that the structure is safe to handle all the loads that it will experience. Another thing that you can do to satisfy strength and stiffness requirements is to do an actual physical test. So here you'll see a picture of a vibration table where uh, Mr. French and Mr. Yonishige are assisting a student in mounting a spacecraft to this vibration table. And then this table will just shake the bejesus out of the setup. And then afterwards you take the spacecraft, um, you look inside the spacecraft box to see that everything survived and that all electronics are still functioning properly. Another responsibility, um, like we were talking about before, the structures subsystem needs to support all other spacecraft subsystems. So even though the radio, like the K-band transmitter and the S-band transponder, those are part of the communication subsystem, the structures lead needs to incorporate those physically into the spacecraft structure. So there is a lot of interfacing with other subsystems that have physical components, kind of negotiating um, where it needs to be in the spacecraft and figuring out if it's in this part of the spacecraft, what are the acceptable loads and the structural integrity of mounting brackets that I need to design for these components. Maybe another notable thing I should add is that for this particular subsystem, there are thrusters. 
which are part of a propulsion subsystem. And those, because they encounter a lot of force and their orientation matters, there is special structural design associated with those particular parts. Um, the star tracker needs to look at a certain field of view uh, and attitude with respect to the spacecraft. And hopefully they're not aligned with the sun sensor. So you see there's a little bit of nuance in juggling all of these different components with all the different subsystems. Another responsibility is that the spacecraft has to attach to the launch vehicles at some point. Um, I have two different setups here where we have the CubeSat form factor. So here's a CubeSat satellite. And then here's the deployer, which is a stand-in for our launch provider. So the CubeSat needs to go inside of this P-Pod deployer, which has a spring. And then the entire setup is stowed in some kind of launch vehicle. Um, typically, if it's going to the ISS, it'll be soft stowed, which means that it's put into like a command module. Some um, resupply mission will go to the ISS where astronauts will uh, exchange from the crew module to the ISS and also bring out all of the supplies. The Peapod deployer would be one of those supplies where they take it into the ISS and then they mount it to the arm and then deployment happens. For something called a hard stow, the spacecraft is mounted directly onto the rocket fairing. And so it is subject to um, all of the very long, uh, all of the very harsh launch conditions. Because it's rigidly mounted to this rocket, um, there's not much vibrational dampening happening. Whereas for the soft stow, the crewed capsule has those mitigations uh, in effect for the humans. For a completely robotic mission, they assume that you can survive these harsher conditions. So you have to take that into consideration when you're designing your spacecraft. Is it a hard stow or is it a soft stow? Um, and depending on those different mounting interfaces, you have to design that mount in mind. This hard stow for this spacecraft is attached with an ESPA ring. So the primary spacecraft has this circular band. Um, and then these secondary spacecraft, which are along the rim, the outside of the cylinder, have a different mounting interface. OK. Um, and then this another responsibility is for the Separation, the orbiting carbon observatory is now separated from the second stage and is flying on its own. <laughs> so this is a video of OCO2 um, separating from the rocket fairing. So let's see it again. The way that it was separating was through an ordnance activated separation, which is like an explosive. So at that joint, there were explosive bolts. And that's what initiated that deployment. Um, and then finally, we have deployment during the mission. So if we're moving chronologically after deployment, you, sorry, after, yeah, rocket deployment, then you, the spacecraft, start to deploy your own mechanisms. I think the James Webb Space Telescope has a really interesting deployment sequence. So you'll see that the structures are all collapsed into this very com compact form. And then the series of deploying the solar panel for power starts to happen. Um, and then you deploy your antenna. And then let's get to the really good stuff. The James Webb Space Telescope, it needs a sun shield and it needs to deploy its mirrors. So you'll see the sequence where this shield is intricately folded up into this really delicate origami shape. And to deploy it, 
there are motors and linear encoders to stretch this sunshield part, um, not only in the width direction, but it's also there are three layers of the sunshield that we'll get to see puff out. So this is for a really large spacecraft, right? Um, there are a ton of intricate mechanisms that need to be deployed for this unfurled spacecraft to operate. But for us, for the Artemis CubeSat, most things are pretty compact. Um, mechanisms do take up volume and they also are associated with risk. We don't necessarily have the volume, although we could take on that risk. So for the, our little CubeSat, the one deployment that we have is that tape measure antenna that we have a burn wire and we put some current through it and that releases that antenna. Not nearly as complex as the James Webb Space Telescope, um, but it doesn't need to be. Our mission is less complex. Okay, um, another responsibility of the structure subsystem is to shield other components from the space environment, where last time we talked about how radiation, atmosphere, um, and we just talked about pyrotechnic shocks, those can all damage the spacecraft. So the structures lead may think about different coatings or different layers of material to shield away from radiation. Or in this case, the atmosphere is generating a lot of pressure and heat. So this is the, um, let's see, this is a heat shield underneath the rover package protected the lander from the heat and pressure of the atmospheric entry as it plowed through the Martian air at thousands of kilometers per hour. Once the space probe had slowed enough, the heat shield was ejected, exposing the rover underneath. The Mars descent imager on the rover captured this astonishing shot of the heat shield a few seconds after it was ejected and still only a few meters away. So that's part of the structure's subsystem. Okay, and then I got a question about how does anodization occur? Uh, and I didn't have a great, I think that a visual representation of how it occurs is more informative. I think it's also faster to explain. So there is a pretreatment of the raw material itself and then the coating happens in stages of baths. Um, but does the entire spacecraft get treated? No, it doesn't. Typically the primary structure, so the uh, external frame, the things that are the largest components of the spacecraft uh, and also towards the surface of the spacecraft are the, the structures that get treated. Um, the smaller components and the ones that are more protected just don't need that as much. Uh, 